What's up, everybody? Welcome to Building Our Power. This is Gabby. And KT. And we're back with another episode. Thank you for checking out our last episode, which was part one of Blood in My Eye by George Jackson. Um, and we're getting right back into it, part two. Before we get into part two, I did want to make an announcement. Um, after about a year and some change, we finally have created a Patreon where you can donate monthly uh, to the cause um, if you would like to keep some reoccurring donations going. And, of course, all of that will go to the fridge, to um, it's cold now, starting to get cold now, to uh, getting coats and stuff for people, for getting hand warmers again. We're starting that back up. And uh, for the propaganda that we're uh, about to start back putting up. If you'd like to do that, the link is in the description for the Patreon. Or if you'd like to do a single donation, that is also in the description. If you would like to join us, that is there as well. Um, all right, guys, let's get right back into it. Blood in my eye PDF is in the description, and we are on the bottom of page 14. Our whole question is. Just what level of consciousness will support the violent revolutionary activity necessary to achieve our ends? And how will we know when this level is reached? Recall, our Mao teaches that when revolution fails, it isn't the fault of the people. It's the fault of the vanguard party. The people will never come to us and say, quote, let's fight. There have never been any spontaneous revolutions. They were all staged, manufactured by people who went to the head of the masses and directed them. The liberalist slogan, quote, you can't get ahead of the people, is meaningless. From what other position can one lead? From the rear? Rear guard leadership? A typical Yankee innovation. I think most of these irresponsible excuse slogans are based on dread. A secret wish to avoid the discomfiture of people's war. In a successful class struggle, the colonial wars of liberation. The vanguard elements did get ahead of the people and pull. There is no other way in forward mass movement. A vanguard which fears that consciousness will outstrip spontaneity, which fears to put forth a bold plan that would compel general recognition even among those who differ from us. Are we not confusing vanguard with rearguard? I'm not implying that the vanguard party act out of the people's role. I'm not implying a, quote, society su superior to society, unquote. We must never forget that it is the people who change circumstances and that the educator himself needs educating. Quote, going among the people, learning from the people, and serving the people, unquote, is really stating that we must find out exactly what the people need and organize them around those needs. If the statement implies a quote coming from, unquote, somewhere else, it substantiates no superiority, but rather a biological existential reality. This concept needs very little substantiating beyond the obvious fact of a nation of slaves who controls no more wealth than some clothes, perhaps a worthless automobile, and a roof of sorts over their heads, but who have been successfully conditioned to feel rich or at least contented. Quote, the task of a revolutionary is to make a revolution, unquote. The word manufacture can be substituted for the word make, and the meaning comes through a little better for us. The fascists have deliberately manufactured a false sense of security by various stratagems. Stratagems. They will never permit conditions to go out of their control as long as, quote, bread and circuses appease. We clearly cannot dodge our responsibilities by giving credence to slogans built around, quote, conditions. Conditions will never be altogether right for a broadly based revolutionary war unless the fascists are stricken by an uncharacteristic fit of total madness. Should we wait for something that is not likely to occur, at least for decades? The conditions that are not present must be manufactured. Recall, we had people who felt conditions weren't right in the 1930s also. The government's bread lines were backed up around every corner and baseball was at its peak. Private ownership of public property should have been destroyed in that decade. But the conditions, quote, weren't right. The vanguard elements betrayed the people of the nation and the world as a result of their failure to seize the time. The consequences were a catastrophic war and a new round of imperialist expansion, this time carried out by the greatest imperialist of all, the Yankee Brigade. There would now be no Indochina situation, to mention one of those dozens of the like situations, if we had taken ourselves seriously then, when all conditions were favorable, 
It was a slightly below conscious desire to avoid doing the U.S. further violence and perhaps a general distaste for organized violence in particular that robbed us of our chance to win on that occasion when, ironically, a win would have cost very little. There wasn't even the illusion of well-being. In a report written by Comrade Jonathan Jackson in November of 1969, just before Fred Hampton's and Mark Clark's murder in Chicago and the shootout at Central Avenue Panther headquarters in Los Angeles, he says, It's come down on us hard now. There are 20 different breeds of pigs patrolling every city in the colony here. I mean, every section of the city that can be said to be predominantly black is saturated is saturated with the establishment's demented gunslingers of every sort. They're all nervous and dangerous as king cobras. Spies, double double agents, entrapments, a war of electronics, house-to-house searches, doors being kicked in. I feel just as you do on these issues. I'm not just going for it, even if it means fighting them by myself. If they kick down the door of my house, I've stopped at, they'll fall in dead. The 9mm Browning weighs something like 2 pounds. I'm not carrying that extra weight around my belt for nothing. It has a 13-round clip. I keep one in the barrel, 14 shots. Save me a cell on murderer's row there. I could have 14 murder charges any day now. Okay, so uh, let's back up. Uh, Something that was really interesting that he was talking about is the history of leftists and liberals. Us getting that liberal... um, rhetoric saying that we can't do a con- we can't have a, a revolution right now because the conditions are not right uh the people uh their consciousness hasn't been awakened enough we don't have enough infrastructure we don't have enough this we don't have enough that we can't do it and i've said that as well like in order for us to execute the ideal revolution. You would think there would need to be some type of organization, some type of at least galvanizing of the people. And I see what he's saying as far as folks say that, but then 20 years later, it's the same old, same old. Well, I feel like that's because people who say, a lot of people who say that aren't saying that because they really think that. They're saying that as a way to just silence people and to not get people thinking uh, about insurrectionary violence. I definitely agree that it, it's it's definitely something where people say, oh, you know, we got to do this and we got to do that as an excuse. I do feel like that's an excuse. And I do agree with him that there's never going to be a perfect revolution, right? There's never going to be uh, something that just pops off. Or not pops off, but there's never going to be something where uh, everything that we do correct is going to come out correct. And I think that's kind of the purpose of a revolution. And for me, as someone who more identifies with anarchy, I don't really think, like, look at previous protests and stuff like that. A lot of times, those are not galvanizing of a whole bunch of people at one time either, though. It's just a whole bunch of kids or a whole bunch of people who are pissed off about something, and they go and blow some shit up. Like, personally, I don't think that we would initially need to educate masses of people in order for a revolution to happen. I think that we can all come behind a uh, cause, and that cause can be as simple as, I hate America and I want it destroyed, or... I don't know, like, I feel like when, when we talk about revolution, we already say it's gonna be, it's gonna be a bloodbath. There's just no way that it's not, right? It's gonna be awful. It's gonna be riots. It's gonna be, it's gonna be bad. A revolution isn't beautiful, and it's not easy. That's the purpose of a revolution. Right. The only, the only thing that I say is the reason that I feel like you, you have to raise consciousness at least for the working class people. Some people just ain't going to be safe. Some people just not going to be on board. But at least when stuff gets to happening, you don't have working class people who could identify with you 
not know what the world you're doing and then automatically see you as an enemy and not as an ally to what you got going on. But I feel like that is, that can, you can only do that through by being in the community and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Um, but I do think that, you know, because like we see, like with the protests and stuff like that, if people don't know what you're protesting about and they are, you know, skeptical or whatever, then people going to be like, if they see you tearing some up or they see you breaking stuff, they're going to be like, uh-uh, throw them in jail, uh-uh, do this. They're going to be calling the police on you. They're going to be, you know. But that's, like, that's, if we if we want to actually say, let's have a revolution tomorrow, those m- minuscule things are not important because three days from now we could be dead anyway because we are actually having a revolution. Like right, a revolution is that, murder. I'm it's, saying you could war. actually have people that would be on your side that you don't even know that they might be on your side because you're just talking to the same couple of people. Yeah, but they may end up being on your side. That's the thing, though. But I you mean, have to get social, your message out there. Social media carries things like crazy right we have a 24-hour news cycle so i don't think it would be that hard if while you're out there doing what you're doing um you also have i don't want to say signs but like you have a specific person if you wanted to talk to the media and that person wouldn't have to be anybody who was even on your side. They could just be somebody who's reporting on it, you know? Mm-mm. Like somebody who knows what the message is, and that's it. A communication person. Yeah, like a communication yeah. person. Well, I that, mean, yeah. that, that would be, I mean, if we're looking at it idealistically, like what we want, that would be good. But at the same time, like I said, I think that if we did do a revolution tomorrow, uh, it would be war. It would be the United States in war with the people. And I currently don't think it would last very long. Exactly. Yeah, but not because we haven't galvanized the people. I think it is. I think it is because, uh, see, we ain't even reading the book. I know. Because, <laughs> but check this out. Like, there's some people where it's like, okay, we have a couple things that we might be able to agree on. Okay. But then it's like some people, yes, we agree, but then you also are not sick. Like the insurrectionary people, January 6th. Right. We could say, oh, hate America, yes. But then why you got these people with you? Because y'all have a common goal. Now they over here shooting the black people. So I just feel like, I don't know. We'll, we'll continue reading because this ain't supposed to be no debate. I know. Uh, we're, we're over here just uh, theorizing about it. But you know? yes, what do y'all think? Put it in the comments. Try to get the picture down every through street. They cruise just a few moments apart at most. Sometimes the stupid bastards are bumper to bumper. Each one of the cruisers has a different residential street here in the black communities that seem to belong to them. It's pattern. Let's say two pig cars, P1 and P2, are both traveling south central, south on central. They'll patrol six to seven blocks on the main street. P1 will then make a left on 50th street. P2 will make a right on 50th street, etc. It works out so that each couple of square blocks is, in effect, always surrounded, cut off, divided, subdivided. Repression is here. I followed them, studied them, hold a few of their cars. You should see how they'll run when they can't tell from exactly what quarter they're drawing fire. We overestimate them or perhaps have little sense of our own power. In the short run, and here I mean in an isolated tactical operation sitting within a particular political design with military weapons we could easily outgun the establishment's first line of defense what for example would the city pigs do if they were confronted by a 38 snug revolver in the hand of a brother who's fired the 38 perhaps 10 times in his life then take the same situation but give the brother a flamethrower stolen from the military give the brother an armored van from inside which he could use said flamethrower give him also two comrades in arms one equipped with an m16 machine gun the other an anti-tank rocket launcher pigs are punks give me 10 cells armed as i've just mentioned and we could start to enforce some of the demands of the people their present show of strength is actually their weakness show they're too visible. Comrades ask me sometimes, what can we do against all the pigs? I stated simply, you put them to death. They look at me as if to say, you're nuts, man. When I go about my explanation, their eyes go blank. Or they're distracted by something five blocks down the street. They're not hearing then. So what's happening? The things I say for us smile seem too fantastic for them to even listen. 
yes, it doesn't seem fantastic for those for them to go against the LAPD with a snub nose revolver. There's a great deal of work to be done with ourselves yet. But the day of the real dragon is coming. Long live the gorilla. Jonathan was 16 years old then, and he had just that year been allowed to drive a car. He liked to drive and observe. He had long since learned to, to like to fight. Guns and weapons in general were his forte. I carefully reminded him that even vanguard violence was organized violence. He would turn one of Fanon's lines, quote, It's time for the talking to end and the acting to begin. In another of the reports, after the Chicago murders of Hampton and Clark and the five-hour shoot at Black Panther's headquarters in Los Angeles, he writes, The fact of American terror, slave existence in general, seems to have almost destroyed the nervous system of the black men here. They are frightened and feel they are smart for being so. Those that were unaffected, those that escaped, those that refused to be intimidated, dismayed, prudent to the point of cowardice, have either joined or supported the Black Panther Party. They get down pretty cold. One point needs to be cleared up, however. I recall you remarking that in an urban guerrilla situation, the military proper must be hidden, separate from the political front, since unlike a classical malgite countryside struggle where the enemy's principal forces are 30 miles down the road with us the enemy is all around within a few moments of the strike there should i feel be a branch that is purely political operating the wrench strikes the breath explode breakfast programs the people's bazaar where all sorts of food and clothing utensils and tools are sold hospitals or clinics free of course and what I will term cottage shops to employ those who will work for the new medium of exchange. Love and loyalty at such things as the makings of clothing and canning of the food for the people's bazaar. There should be the super secret ranch to enforce. The military, the comrades with the nervous equipment to make the best use of the M6, M60, the M16, the flamethrower, the hand grenade, the mortar, our armored vans, and equipped in front and plenty of gun ports, bulletproof tires, etc. You dig? One of the large trucks properly prepared. Plastic may be the best armor. One and a half inches will stop a 220 grain slug fired from a 45 submachine gun. Two inches to three inches will protect you from high power rifle bullets. And with the heavy armor piercing ammo equipped M60 port in the front cab, pointing in the direction that the truck is moving along forward, forward along the street. It's more effective than a tank of the Yankee style. The machine gun in the front cab and one pointing out the rear from the trailer has whatever street they are moving down in a guerrilla ambush tactic we'll call angulation. Each one of these guns pointing front and back, up the street and back down it, has the advantage of being able to rack that entire street with only a single back and forth lateral movement. One armor piercing bullet may render several of the unrighteous dead. And comrade, the pigs are so proud of their new little copters, they're suckers. It's almost comical to hear them boast and watch them look to the sky with, power, with pride of power. The pig who will get up in one of those things is as stupidly suicidal as a duck trying to outflow a charge of a 12-gauge shot. The fierce and beautiful Kong shoot down a couple dozen of their biggest and best copters. Yankee invention can produce every week. These things that the pigs use are toys, sitting ducks. One, I mean one solid or armor-piercing 30 caliber bullet aimed at one of those several points, the tail rotor, the hub of the main rotor, or even the operator, will reduce $200,000 worth of Yankee intervention to crap. I was pursuing this joke of a secondary education when the whole thing occurred, but acting with my small thing would have hardly helped me much. Though it may have helped raise consciousness some, the besiers attack from the rear. The idea of it, strong. Militarily, it would have demonstrated to the pigs that the Panther Party is not out there on limb alone. And of course, it would have promoted among the people the confidence of ability we always speak on when we're together. How would they have felt, the pigs and the people, if the nameless, faceless, lightning-swift soldier of the people could have reached up, twisted the tail of their $200,000 death bird, and hurled it into the streets? Do the conscience broken and ablaze? I think that sort of thing has more to do with consciousness than anything else. 
I can think of. Long live the Panther, power to the people who don't fear freedom. Jonathan was 16 years old then, I repeat. So, this was uh, George Jackson's brother, um, who eventually was murdered by the pigs as he was trying to uh, help uh, rescue his brother and, you know, pretty much doing a Sada Shakur. Um, but uh, overall, what, what he's talking about is with organization and with a few powerful weapons, there is a lot that could be accomplished by the people. And uh, we ourselves just don't know how powerful we are. You know, we hear all the time, and even back then, I'm sure, you know, you're not going to last in a fight with the military. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. But we got to think about it. The Vietnam... Y'all seen them documentaries? They fought like hell. Yeah, they did. And they were poor. And they were poor. They didn't have much. They had a little bit of funding, but barely. And they was able to defeat America. America gets beat all the time by people. And for us, it's just, we just have to, we, we just have to have confidence in ourselves. And know that things can be accomplished. Um, My thought process is, is that, I feel like nowadays, because we have so much media, like celebrities, and we have became so engaged in that, or like material possessions and things like that, like people are less likely to be talking about political movements than they probably were in like the 60s, do you think? Yes. Yeah, Uh, so I, I feel like... And and I think that's by purpose, right? Yeah. We always talk about I always talk about propaganda because that's that's the number one thing I feel like right now. If we could just stop like all of the extreme pop propaganda that the United States pushes out, that would at least give people a chance to think logically. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of my thought. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to one day do a personal study on. Uh, you know, when did celebrity... I mean, celebrity has always been big. There's always been celebrities. It's always been a part of American right. culture. But when did it come to the point where it's like, celebrity is God's status. Celebrity is like, I tie my identity to this celebrity. If this celebrity does good, I then feel like I'm doing good in my life. Um, like, when did that get to an extreme, really? To, to when people are, like, starting to, like... It's really like daydreaming. Like, you see <laughs> Megan Thee Stallion doing good. She on TV. Yada, yada, yada. Yes, I'm proud for her. I'm proud for her. Dopamine hit. Somehow I feel like my life is better for a second. <laughs> and it's like, what? Um, or like you actually know them and then you're like throwing death threats at somebody that you don't even know on the internet. Like defending Meg Thee Stallion or defending other people, other celebrities. Yeah. I saw some dude, and we're going to get into it. I saw some dude, some little, I guess he part of Nation of Islam, but he posts on, he posts on this Memphis page that we have. <laughs> Memphis, raise your expectation, check it out. But, I literally had to talk, I was trying to get an understanding from this guy. Okay, we ain't going to talk about Kanye like that, but we, but he <laughs> posted like, this is the Nation of Islam, okay? Farrakhan, Malcolm X, everybody. He literally said that the Lord was using uh, Kanye West, exposing everybody to help uh, liberate the black people. And I just had to, like, get clarification because I know that's not what that's not what they teach up in the Nation of Islam. And I know that's not with anybody who had any sense of... Uh, seriousness would say um and i just had to think about like we are so devoid of leaders not saying we need a leader Mm -mm. but we're so devoid of real radical leaders think about this or real radical like like teaching propaganda like (laughs) period or just radical just seeing radical people on television literally that how do we go from malcolm x huey newton asada shakur uh, Kwame Ture, 
people who literally at some point in their lives was like, we need to get a revolution. We need to start a social society. I'm dedicating my life to the people. We have to do stuff for ourselves. How do we go from that to a man who wants to sell some clothes and be kick in with some white people? Wants to marry white people. Wants to talk like a white man. He is a good person. He is the leader. He is the voice. That is ridiculous. That is that is so sad. That's a whole other level of psyop. Like we have gotten so twisted. That's sad. I don't think I don't think it's it's such a crazy idea. I really don't. Because like like we talk about, like most of what you see as liberal or progressive in this world is very uh, surface level. Everyone remembers Kanye saying that about George Bush, right? Everyone remembers that. Even I was I was probably too young to even care about politics, um, but I still remember that. And I remember people talking about it. And so I do, I personally think that we have drank the Kool-Aid, for better, a better, uh, for better words. We've drank the Kool-Aid for just so long that it just, it doesn't seem crazy for that people to believe that, that. that. You think that the cyanide is real Kool-Aid now. You yeah, drank that's it for so correct. long that literally you don't, you can't and, decipher between and, the real or the cyanide. Here's the thing about that guy with the Nation of Islam. Is, aren't they like, uh, very hierarchical and things like that? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's possible too that he still has to uh, subscribe to some white supremacist ideals yeah. in order for him to believe that you know he's the head of the house and he's the top of the hierarchy of or whatever. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. you know it's not too to me it's not too big of a stretch for people like him um, to believe in that, especially if. Especially if you've got propaganda twenty four seven coming at you, right? I'm right. just saying, yeah. like in the course of history, like if if people if our uh, descendants a thousand years from now were to look back mm-hmm. and be like, "Damn, y'all really be- what?" At one point, y'all really was doing some. Y'all really had movement. Y'all really had people that were down for the cause, and now y'all spending y'all time fighting on Twitter about. <laughs> Somebody that make beats. And <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be in the history books like that. So me either. Everybody else, I wasn't like one of them folks. So <laughs> don't put me in there. But yeah, just back to this whole thing about, yes. That's, that's one of the reasons why, like, we have all these guns and stuff coming into our communities. But there's a reason why you know, we can't get together and actually do something productive with it. We're just, we're we're doing all this unnecessary stuff. There are literally, even in Tennessee, if we think about Tennessee alone, there's probably so many guns that we don't know about, uh, that the police don't know about, that no one knows about, except, like, maybe your credit card, which then, you know, if you do it the smart way, then no one will know about it. Um, but, yeah, we could definitely do something with that. But people are, we're, here's another thing, too, that we don't think about. We're so caught up in meeting our own needs, it's almost impossible to think about anything else. And that's by design, right? The American government, the government, whatever, they're not going to give you enough in order for you to no longer think about your needs. Mm-hmm. You know, like, to me, and I'm sure to other people who do carry a gun with them 24-7 who are, like, constantly out here looking for, to get their needs met, that's your your next meal is the only thing that's on your mind. You're not thinking about, oh, maybe I should do a revolution. <laughs> no, you're thinking about, oh, how can I eat? And so that's kind of like, when we talk about revolution, I think it's most important that we're talking more so about material needs and how those can be met like they're like he talked about there's got to be a certain group of people who are meeting those material needs for the people who don't want to be out there in the war at the front lines 
Yeah, that's what we used to t- we talked about in that episode. Mutual aid is useless. Yeah, like, you know, people were just saying, "Oh, you got to just do the the revolution," but you have to actually make a case for what you got going on. You gotta know, you, you gotta know, know people. You know, you know. Okay, we're gonna read a little bit more and then we gonna uh, get out of here. Consciousness is the opposite of indifference, of blindness, blankness. Promoting consciousness involves the general dissemination of the concept that each of us is part of a universal action and interaction, that poles are somewhere connected, that there are material causes for trauma, vertigo, degenerate diseases. Connections, connections, cause and effect, clarity on the relation and interrelations, the connections of the past, continuity, flow, movement, the awareness that nothing, nothing remains the same for long. And it follows that if a thing is not building, it's certainly decaying, that life is revolution, and that the world will die if we don't read and act out in its imperatives. Not on its own will it die, but rather because the forces of reaction have created imbalances that will kill it. The seeds of its own destruction, our destruction too, is the epoch of the bomb, the nerve gases, the mass of precipitation of industrial waste. Consciousness is knowledge, recognition, foresight. Common experience and perception, sensibility, alertness, mindfulness. It stirs the senses, the blood. It exposes and suggests. It will objectify and rage direct. There are no positive formulas for a thing so complex. We have guidelines only to help us with its growth. This means that after we are done with our books, they must be put aside and the search for method will depend on observations, correct analyses, creativity, and seizing the time. Sometime after December the 4th, 1969, shootout around the Panther Party Los Angeles headquarters, Jonathan commented on the connections, the aftermath. Have you grasped the significance of the backlash? It has stung the fascists. The people are in foment. All of them, of all persuasion. They don't dig midnight or dawn riding parties. Bullets with steel jackets, cowardly pigs perched upon their roofs. The same gases manufactured for use against the Vietnamese liberators blowing back in their faces. Repression. Do you see the effect it has on the uncommitted? Comrade, repression exposes. While drawing violence from the beast, the Vanguard Party is demonstrating for the world to examine just exactly what terms their rule is predicated on. Their power to organize violence are acquiescence. But check, blacks are conditioned to acquiescence They have, in general, been led to believe that this system is the product and property of the white man, that the white man will protect it with his all, that the white man is a killer, a reflex killer, that all we can ever hope for is reforming or expanding of the system to include the few of us who can make ourselves acceptable. It's too big for us. You can't fight City Hall. It can't happen in America and all that shit. Pig shit. Double check all of the objective conditions are present here in the black colony for revolution. The physical thing, I mean. Want and want to. East Los Angeles hasn't changed a bit since you were out. Watts is still a depressed area. Many of the west side districts are starting to resemble the older black districts. The issue of employment is still the same. We do 30 to 40% of the nation's work for 1% of the returns. And a huge pull of us is always kept unemployed to reduce the value of the labor of those who are. Just like 10 years ago, just like 1864-65, when we were thrown on the labor market hungry, ragged, crowded, and to clapboards and unhappy, nothing has changed since you left the street, comrade. Not in this respect, at least. Perhaps our conditions stand out a little more glaringly, that's all. But you know what's been building? The vanguard has viciously attacked the system. The omnipotent system attacked by the slave. Sort of like the worker bee growing so disgusted with the quality of his life that he turns and attacks the bearer. The other bees will understand. They do understand. And all sorts of bees, even those who thought the bear their rightful ruler, see him differently when he foams at the mouth and bites at his own tail. I think you were on the right track with this idea concerning repression. It is, it has to be, a part of the revolutionary process, a necessary stage in the development of revolutionary consciousness, the situation being as it was and is. The black experience is what I'm referring to. The milder Lynch example, type repression, is accepted by us as a necessary part of life. But the new harsher thing brought on by the political thrust of the Vanguard Party 
serves to show even the most tractable of the reformers among us that firstly, the system will not or actually cannot meet our demands. Secondly, it clearly illustrates the real terms of our existence under capitalism, the nature of it, and how foul a piece of the pie would ever be if we could have some. One fundamental problem remains, the survival of the vanguard political party, and I mean in good form. We must think to the righteous fielding of the clandestine army. John. All right, that was page 25. Okay, so, um, of course, this is... Uh, Georgia Jackson's brother writing back to him after the shootout saying how, you know, after that went down, people started side-eyeing the cops even more and being like, hmm, interesting. And about how that was a way to, to you know, expand consciousness, allow people to see, you know, hmm, something isn't right. Something, something, hmm. And then them seeing that, you know, people were willing to fight against the cops, it kind of piqued something in their brain like, hmm. You know, they may not fight, but they may have some type of empathy towards you. It may get them to thinking. It may get them to questioning things. Them saying that you are so fiercely fighting against something they thought was unfightable. But yeah, so that's what we have to do. We have to, you know, in our daily lives. Inspire. Inspire people and be like, hey, you ain't got to do this. I ain't doing this. Look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, filming the cops when they over here doing something. I'm uh, not letting them disrespect me. I'm, uh, you know, bending a little this, bending a little that. And we can do, and I'm going to do that because fuck them for them. Uh, You know, that's, we're not really saying this. We're not really saying that. This is all educational. <laughs> for legal purposes. For legal purposes. <laughs> okay. So, yes, uh, any comments about the passages, you can uh, put them in the description. All right, guys, remember, uh, Patreon, we got that up. And if you would like to donate monthly to that, you can do so. It starts as low as $1. Um, if you would like to give singly, you can do that as well. If you'd like to join us in Memphis, you can do so. Link, the links are all in the description. Um, thank you, everybody, for checking this episode out. This has been Gabby. And Kay.